Hello and welcome. You're watching Coronavirus Facts versus Myths. I'm Gargi Rawat. Now, the big story right now, the UK has revised its travel policy to include Covishield vaccine as an approved vaccine. This after India had raised strong objections and warned of tit-for-tat measures. But Indians double vaccinated with the shot still have to quarantine if traveling to the UK. The updated UK guidelines say formulations of the four listed vaccines such as AstraZeneca, Covishield, AstraZeneca and Avax Zirviria and Moderna qualify as approved vaccines. However, according to a UK High Commission statement yesterday, it said its government is working with India to expand recognition of the vaccination certification. The implication here is that the problem is not Covishield, but doubts over the vaccination certification in India. In fact, Adar Poonawala of the Serum Institute of India has reacted to NDTV and said that we are delighted that Covishield is recognized as a vaccine equivalent to AstraZeneca on the official government UK website. However, the matter for travel and quarantine is not resolved and all those looking to travel to the UK should carefully follow official entry guidelines. Well, to talk... More about this, we're now joined by Dr. Subhash Salunke, a Chief Technical Advisor on COVID to the Maharashtra government. Uh, doctor, this is a very curious uh, case. You know, till yesterday, everybody was very upset and outraging over the fact that COVID shield was not being recognized. It was being called vaccine racism. But now it seems that the issue lies with the certification process. So does this mean they're raising questions over the COVID uh, platform? Sure, I know uh, the such controversy was unwarranted for, and as a matter of fact, uh, as um, uh, Mr. Punawala has clearly indicated, the manufacturing process and uh, the way the uh, vaccine is being manufactured in India is absolutely nowhere there is any compromise with the you know what happens in AstraZeneca in UK or any other country and that is the reason quality of vaccination or quality of vaccine manufacturing is absolutely no doubt that it is of international standards now certification process what they are raising I think this could be absolutely a kind of a bureaucratic or, uh, you know, bureaucratic technical question, which needs to be resolved. They have to appreciate that by, uh, you know, raising such kinds of an issues, unnecessarily it is creating problem for literally hundreds and thousands of the passengers, students and others who are traveling from India to UK. So I think uh, it is... It will be uh, not only essential, but it becomes obligatory for UK or uh, the government of UK to ensure that the, these hurdles are uh, not addressed uh, because there is actually no address, uh, there is actually no hurdle. It's only the bureaucratic technical issue that needs to be resolved ASAP. All right, so you're thinking it, it's probably something to do more technical. You know, the website, uh, the UK website does say they want date of birth, whereas, whereas we know that our uh, certificate does give the age of the person. So it could be something as minor as that. We still don't know. Absolutely. We are wait, awaiting more news. Uh, though, if I can just tell you, doctor, that we have a reaction from RS Sharma, uh, the CEO of the National Health Authority to India, and he's the person who's in charge of COVID. And he says there are no issues on COVID with COVID certification. The system is entirely W. WHO compliant. We continue to have discussions with International Civil Aviation Organization as well. The UK High Commissioner visited me on September 2nd and they wanted to understand the COVID system and the technical aspects. So, uh, you know, on one hand, uh, uh, you know, uh, Mr. R.S. Sharma saying that everything is on board, that it is WHO compliant. So it's very unusual and hopefully this is something we can, you know, sort out with the UK. Absolutely. And there was absolute, there was no need. As a matter of fact, as Mr. Sharma has clearly indicated, the, the entire development of even the processes have gone through a lot of rigorous steps by government of India, followed strictly by respective states. So there should not have been any issue. I don't know why in UK such issues. First, if there would have been any quality issues, why they are saying if there is no more quality issue, it's only technical. That means there has to be some kind of an, um, you know, uh, difficult to understand the reasons that are being raised at the UK level, which they need to resolve faster. I mean, they have to appreciate that they are dealing with a country like India. It's not that you are dealing with a country which has no know-how or expertise. We are competent enough. No, they have to appreciate that. We are global producers of the vaccines and supplying it to 
hundreds of countries so uh, they don't uh, they are dealing with uh, country like india they have to appreciate and they must resolve it asap no absolutely and hopefully talks will take place because as you said uh, these are vaccines that were exporting uh, all over the world as well we're going to uh, again begin exporting from next month uh, so if it's just a small technical issue and this is something that raised a lot of anger here in india and also even threats of reciprocal action if it's not resolved at the earliest I mean, uh, why can't Britishers understand? Or you people understand that you know you are not dealing with a uh, 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 developing or underdeveloped country. You are dealing with a powerful nation like India. So be careful about it. We have every and most important, they are aware. They must be aware. We have rigorous standards. DCGI, Government of India, respect to state governments. They are all. We are very, very uh, fastidious as far as following the standards laid down and approved by WHO. It's not that only we are talking about our own country standards, but they are also approved internationally and accepted by other countries also. Absolutely. Thank you so much, Dr. Subhash Salunke, for joining us on the program, yeah. and um, hopefully, it will be resolved very soon. Now, a special focus on the state of the pandemic in the world, and we're joined by Dr. Isaac Bogoch, infectious disease physician and scientist based out of the University of Toronto. Thank you so much, uh, doctor, for joining us on the program. And if if we can start off by you know understanding what the situation is like in Canada currently, is the disease there under control? Canada is obviously a massive country, and in certain parts of the country, things are going okay. In other parts of the country, there are significant problems. So the two provinces that are having the most significant issues right now are Alberta and Saskatchewan. Uh, they had lifted all public health measures to control COVID-19, and what they saw was a very rapid rise in cases. And still, this was even in the context of having access to vaccines. And you know, if you look at those provinces. Roughly about 75% of eligible, not the total population, but the eligible population, had received at least the first dose of a vaccine. But even with that, there were still, you know, many, many people who remained unvaccinated. When those public health measures were lifted, cases rose very, very quickly. And now, in those places, they're they're in they're in a crisis mode. Their hospitals are full, their ICUs are full, and they're having to really use surge capacity and and really look for outside help to get them through the next few weeks because they now have reimposed public health measures to help get things under control. So, doctor, is this problem that you're seeing similar to what uh, is being seen in the U.S., where some states have more vaccine hesit hesitancy and politics over vaccine, and therefore cases are rising? Yes, absolutely. And, and certainly, I think it's fair to say that while we're in the vaccine era and while vaccines are rolling out some places faster than others, the pandemic is not over. And if you act like the pandemic is over, you're in for a big surprise because we will see cases rise and we will see healthcare systems that get overwhelmed. I think that's true for the vast majority of the world. There may be a few spots on Earth that have vaccinated enough people uh, that they can lift these control measures. But certainly if we look at, for example, the United States and in particular the southern part of the United States, where vaccine uptake was lower relative to the rest of the country and where uh, public health measures were, were lifted, uh, you're seeing, uh, you, we saw this massive rise in cases. And, and you know, we saw headlines of hospitals overwhelmed, uh, ICUs full to the brink, um, an unacceptable number of deaths. And of course, it's not just a metric of do you live or do you die? The other metric, of course, is you can get really sick even if you live you can get very, very sick and require hospitalization. The other important point, too, is that when healthcare systems are overwhelmed, it doesn't just mean that people suffering from COVID-19 are going to get uh, limited care. It means that this has tremendous, significant ripple effects for everybody else in the area that needs healthcare. So uh, that could be someone who might need cancer surgery, heart surgery, eye surgery, hip and knee surgery, or have uh, heart attacks or strokes and need to come to the hospitals to receive healthcare. If your healthcare system is overwhelmed, you you have uh, basically lowered the quality of care and access to care for a large community, and that's a huge problem. All right, doctor, let's talk about the issue of booster shots, and that's become a controversy. WHO has asked countries very clearly not to give booster doses just yet. Uh, there seem to be differ differing opinions on the need for a booster dose just now. 
Yeah, I would agree with that, and I really like the WHO stance. And in fact, the WHO really clarified their stance. They said, "Listen, there are a sm- there's a small segment of the population that would certainly benefit from a third dose, namely frail elderly individuals or immunocompromised individuals. That's that's not unreasonable, but you know you shouldn't be giving booster doses to everybody in your population, especially." since there are billions and billions of people who haven't even received a first dose of a vaccine. I mean, this is absolutely ridiculous. Uh, so I, I think it's fair to say that it is, there is some very good science and very good data emerging that demonstrates that a third dose of a vaccine would really help for some people, not everybody, but some people, and that we should really be focusing our efforts globally to vaccinate uh, co- uh, countries where they have populations where they just have very limited vaccine rollout. I think the other important point, too, is that, you know, there might be a point where everybody needs a third dose of a vaccine, but that, that, that time is definitely not now. I don't think we have any compelling data demonstrating that everybody needs a third dose right now. We should be open-minded to it that it might be needed in the future, but that's clearly not needed now. If people are giving third doses now, I think there's very reasonable evidence to, to suggest that that would be immunocompromised individuals or perhaps frail elderly individuals that, that just don't mount the same degree of an immune response to the two doses as the general public would. Now, Johnson & Johnson uh, has said that a second dose of their vaccine in two months means better protection, but they were meant to be a one-dose vaccine. So uh, what does this mean? Well, I mean, I think there's a few ways to see it. One is that many of us watching this from the very get-go sort of had a suspicion that the single dose Johnson and Johnson would be very good, which it is, but it could be better with that second dose. And um, there was certainly discussions about this, even when Johnson and Johnson was rolling out their data for their first dose vaccine series. Now with the second dose, it's pretty clear that a a dose two months later does provide uh, better protection than just the single dose alone. I think that's also pretty reasonable. We also have to appreciate, too, that the virus has changed a bit as well, and we're dealing with a Delta variant, whereas um, a lot of these vaccines were really, well, not all of these vaccines that we're using now were really designed for the initial uh, version of COVID-19 that emerged from Wuhan, and the virus obviously has changed significantly since then. So, um, you know, that might be driving things a little bit as well. But in general, I think it's it's fairly reasonable. Um, in Canada, we're not using the Johnson & Johnson vaccine. We've approved it, but we, we really aren't, aren't using it. It's used mostly in the United States and elsewhere in the world. Um, but yeah, I think, I think that data is pretty compelling that a second dose is, is helpful. A recent study found that uh, variants are becoming uh, better at being airborne now. What does this mean, especially going forward with the new variants emerging? It's hard to know. I mean, it, it really is hard to know and hard to predict, you know, what the next variant is. It's pretty reasonable to know where the variants will emerge. And those, sadly, those will emerge more, most likely in, in areas that have low vaccine access. Yet another reason why we should really be focusing our efforts on vaccine equity, global vaccine equity. Obviously, it's the right thing to do. It's the ethical thing to do. But in addition to that, it will help from a global standpoint by reducing the likelihood that variants of concern will emerge. Um, You know, in terms of transmissibility, yeah, Delta variant is very, very transmissible. And I think there's been a lot of work looking into, you know, uh, more virus either being uh, produced or or a higher viral shedding or more affinity to receptors. I mean, we could talk about different mechanisms, but the key thing here is we know where it's transmitted and it's primarily transmitted in indoor settings. How do you create a safer indoor space? You know, limit the number of people in an, in an indoor space, uh, mask, uh, good ventilation in those settings. I mean, those are the key key features. And of course, if you have access to vaccines, vaccination is still fantastic. Of course, it's not perfect, but it's still a fantastic layer of protection. And uh, the other big issue that everybody's talking about right now is the school experience and opening schools here in India. We're seeing, you know, different regions having a staggered opening of schools. We're getting the vaccine soon for children, but most experts say that we need to move on with the schools opening. Right. I mean, it's interesting because schools are really one of the few sanctioned mass gathering events on the planet. And... It, 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 you know, it's tough because in many jurisdictions, those are sanctioned mass gathering events 
with an unvaccinated population in many places. Um, so it's fair to say that, of course, kids can get COVID-19. Of course, kids can transmit COVID-19. And if you don't take steps to control the spread of this in a classroom, you will amplify this virus in your community. And you know, we've seen this time and time again. You have to take steps to, to reduce the risk of transmission in the schools. And you can take simple, take simple steps to do that, right? You can, for starters, reduce the number of, of uh, students in the classroom. You can vaccinate or promote vaccination in those who are eligible for vaccination. We know that masking can certainly help. We know that ventilation can certainly help. And ventilation doesn't have to be, you know, sophisticated, expensive equipment. It could also be opening doors and windows as well. So there's a lot that can be done to lower the risk of transmission within a classroom. One of the other things that often gets lost in these discussions is, is the obvious, is if you keep the virus under control in the community, you will also lower the probability of introducing the virus in the classroom. So, you know, community control efforts are extremely important to help with healthy, safe schools. And this comes at a time in India where there's a lot of talk of a possible third wave, but there's also an expert view uh, that in India, COVID will become endemic in six months' time. Uh, what would you say on that? Uh, so I, I'm completely in agreement with that, with the narrative that this virus is not going away. And at some point, however we define pandemic and endemic, it will transition to an endemic virus. Like, we get it. This, this virus isn't going away. What gives me a little bit of hesitation is the confidence as to the timeline on that. And I just don't think we can have that confidence that, you know, it's going to be blank number of months away. Listen, we obviously have to do our best to plan, but I think we have to do a better job at communicating uncertainty. Um, you know, some people have been vaccinated. That's fantastic. And that will help. Some people have had the infection and have recovered from that infection, they have some degree of immunity. Like, we can't ignore that. That will help. But it, we need to vaccinate as many people as possible to really ensure that those subsequent waves are smaller and smaller and smaller and don't have the same degree of disruption on our society as they have. Um, but, you know, putting a timeline on it, I think, is a bit foolish. I mean, it's helpful to model this, but it's, it's, just, it's just challenging to do because it's, it, we, we, we don't have all the answers. We don't. Um, you know, there are variants that might be emerging. There are limitations in the data that we have. But there are things that are under our control, right? We know how to control this at the community level and at a local level. And we can do things to do that. And we can certainly promote vaccination, especially, especially in under-vaccinated communities. I think we talk about global vaccine equity as being extremely important, which it is. But if you think more locally, you know there are certain communities in any jurisdiction in the world that are under-vaccinated versus others. And they tend to be lower-income communities and, depending on where you are in the world, sometimes racialized communities. And we really need to have significant outreach, good community outreach, uh, working with local community organizations, with community leaders, to really promote vac vaccination in those under-vaccinated communities. And, and, you know, we can't ignore the barriers to vaccination. There are tremendous barriers. There might be language barriers mobility barriers, financial barriers, etc. We really have to do everything we can to lower those barriers to vaccination to really ensure that there is equitable uptake of vaccines and equitable access to vaccines uh, in, in communities that are under vaccinated. And that's where our focus should be. Thank you so much, Dr. Isaac, for joining us on the program.